Hi, Steve here at blessedhopeforever.com. We're going to continue on in our survey in the book of Acts. Thank you for joining us. Our Father and our God, we stand at your, in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for the privilege that you continue to give us the opportunity to again study your word together. May the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified. May the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts, stripping away any error, whether we make foolish assumptions or conclusions, but teach to each of us the truth of your word. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Okay, in our Bible survey series, we're at the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. We are looking at Paul's missionary journeys. He comes to Derby and Lystra. There he finds Timothy. Finds Timothy to be a man of reputation, and he joins with him in his missionary activity. Timothy was circumcised. His mother was a Jew. His father was a Greek because circumcision uh, was a Jewish rite. Obviously, Paul felt that it would be better, uh, it would, or better his ministry among the Jews if Timothy were to be circumcised. Uh, we know, on the other hand, that in the case of Titus, uh, Titus was not circumcised. They went to Troas, uh, guided by the Holy Spirit. I think that the, the thing that we need to see in the opening couple of paragraphs of chapter 16 is that they were led by the Spirit as we should be in our work for Christ. Too many times we plan ahead and we set the program and uh, the scheme of, of things the way that we think it ought to be and it's obvious from the message that they were led by the Holy Spirit. For example, in verse 6, they were forbidden to speak the word in Asia. Now, that, that doesn't seem to be very consistent to some in some Christians' minds. There, there shouldn't be any place where that we shouldn't preach the word, yet it's clearly evident that the Holy Spirit uh, tells us at this particular time at least uh, he did not intend for Paul to preach the word there in Asia. They attempted to go into Bithynia, uh, verse 7. Uh, but once again, the Holy Spirit uh, did not allow it. That is not where he wanted them to go. They came to Troas, and there I'm sure you're all familiar with the uh, Macedonian vision at uh uh, at a, a vision where someone from Macedonia in the, in the vision said, uh, come over to Macedonia and help us. Uh, we read in verse 10 that they assumed that, uh, in fact, they were assured that the Holy Spirit was sending them into Macedonia, so they left immediately. We know that they left uh, an effective work in Troas, and they went into Macedonia. There they came to Philippi, and they fellowshiped with certain women that had come together for prayer uh, down by the water. Uh, we can only imagine what these women prayed about and, and, and what they studied, but there were some devout women at Philippi, and the Lord led Paul and his companions to, uh, to them. And that was the beginning of the church at Philippi. One of the most precious letters in the New Testament. I am absolutely confident that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. You know, what it must have been to the heart and the life of Paul to leave that handful of believers at Philippi. As he went on, they came upon uh, verse 14. 
a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, and it was God who, who touched her heart and opened it as she listened to what Paul had to say, as, as she listened to Paul's preaching. She was identified by the Holy Spirit uh, into the family and the household of God, and they stayed there, and they lived in her house. And while they were there, there was a certain uh, maid who had a spirit of divination, that is, uh, she could predict and, and foretell uh, things, and she kept following them around until pa Paul kind of finally got fed up with it and rebuked her that spirit, and it left her, and those who had control of her life uh, now, uh, they no longer had any income, and so they began an uprising against Paul and Silas, saying that, that these men were troubling their city as they had the rest of the world. And so the magistrates uh, had been arrested and mistreated, and, and had they had them beaten with stripes, many stripes, and then they cast them into prison. Uh, we now have the account beginning at verse 25 of the Philippian jailer. We're all well familiar with that account, I believe, because uh, it's been used a lot uh, as a text for, I don't know, millions probably of evangelistic messages. I think that we uh, need to be well aware of the fact that the Philippian jailer as as any jailer in the Roman uh, culture was charged with the security of his prisoners, one of the best ways to make certain that nobody escaped from you was to you know, threaten your family and threaten you with death. You know that you'd be killed if you know if somebody escaped, which made it uh, imperative that the jailer keep them well secured. However, the Lord opened the doors of the prison. And when the Philippian jailer saw that, he was going to commit suicide so that he wouldn't be held responsible. But Paul stops him. The jailer uh, called for a light. He, he sprang in and, and then he said that, that what we've all heard, you know, good sirs, what must I do to be saved? And as I've already pointed out, that's the uh, text of many an evangelistic message. I believe that the Lord expects us to use our spiritual intelligence and judgment. We're told by the Holy Spirit that no man, not one, seeks God, not one, and not one serves God. And there is none righteous, no, not one. If this Philippian jailer is seeking God, then Romans is a farce, or the, the Philippian jailer has been touched by the Holy Spirit, and it's the new creation speaking, which is what I believe. Now, you, you cannot reach the conclusion uh, that is generally reached that this is, a, this is an unredeemed man seeking for redemption. There is no such man. The Holy Spirit clearly declares that nobody does that. There is none that seeks after God. No, not one. And for anyone to stand up and say that, well, there are hungry hearts seeking God is to deny the truth of the Word of God. There are not hungry hearts seeking God. There are redeemed hearts that are hungry, and need to be fed, but there are no unredeemed people roaming around looking for something where God can, uh, can fill the, the void and change their life. You know, there may be dissatisfied people, to be, to be sure, but they're not seeking God. They're seeking satisfaction. They're seeking peace. They're seeking rest. They're seeking, I don't know, God knows what, but they are not seeking God. So either this Philippian jailer is redeemed and he has been in, uh, inducted by the Holy Spirit into the family of God. He might not know it yet, but he is now 
but he has a new life. He's got a new heart. He has a new will. He has a, a new mind. And it's that new will, that new heart, that declares what must I do to be delivered. Or since he was about ready to kill himself, I suppose you could say, well, uh, he was ready to off himself, you know, because, you know, it could be, could be that he was asking him what he could do to be saved from the authorities. I don't believe that. Uh, it has been suggested because Paul, you know, says, you know, hey, don't, don't hurt yourself. Don't kill yourself. Everybody's here. They, they could have gotten up and walked out. The doors were open and everyone's hands were loose. Verse 26. There isn't any reason in the world for the prisoners to stay there. I don't know whether it's because of, of Paul that they stayed there or whether Paul and his company were the only prisoners there. I think there were other prisoners there. But they could have walked out and they didn't. And it's Paul who spoke up and said, don't kill yourself. You know, we're all here. What must I do to be delivered? Sozo is the word. Delivered from what? What? From Roman punishment, I guess, or from the devastations that's going to come, not only against me, but against my family. If anybody escapes. So he's either already been touched by the Holy Spirit, and that may rather be the logical conclusion because we see as we read through verse 34 that he and all his household were identified with the Holy Spirit, with, with the body of Christ. So it's up to you whether you decide whether or not they were uh, baptized with water. I suggested to you uh, on numerous occasions that you know when we began this book of Acts, this survey, you know, that we have a perfect illustration by the Holy Spirit of the two baptisms that are in the New Testament, one with water, which was for Israel, John 1, 31. And I knew him not, but that he should be manifest to Israel. Therefore, am I come baptizing with water. The reason baptize, baptism was... Uh, uh, with water was to manifest Christ to Israel. But I'm not an Israelite. I'm a Gentile. And he who comes after me will not baptize you with water, but with the Holy Spirit and with fire. We have the illustration of Paul's baptism in Acts uh, chapter 9, uh, where he was not baptized with water, but with the Holy Spirit. And, and that's what fell on the Gentiles. Water was used in every case in the book of Acts as a testimony to Jews. And I suggested to you folks that as we began this survey, that when the Holy Spirit means water, He says water. And, and when He doesn't say water, if it's not there in your text, uh, the only natural conclusion is that we would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I conclude... Uh, that's true of the Philippian jailer. It does not say that there was water. It does say that there was water in the case of the Ethiopian uh, uh, Munich because of Philip, uh, who's a Jew, and Philip has to carry that testimony back to the rest of the apostles that God visits the Gentiles just as Peter did with the Roman. Well, the uh, Philippian jailer, of course, he uh, sends a word that these men are here. They're all safe. And so the magistrates say, well, okay, we've beaten them. We've punished them. Uh, I think they were frightened to death. You know, they're not going to preach anymore, so just let them go. And it's here that you read in verses 35 to 40, of chapter 16, a false claim to Roman uh, citizenship. Now, we know later on in the book of Acts that there is one who says to Paul with, with great price, I ordained this privilege. Now, you need to understand that in Rome, there is nothing higher than a Roman citizen. 
I've always felt as a patriotic Oklahoma red blood American that, you know, I, uh, I wish citizenship in the U.S. Uh, meant as much uh, in the world as citizenship in the Roman Empire as, as what it did in the Roman Empire. You know, you did not mess with a Roman citizen. Rome, the, the entire nation, the entire kingdom of Rome would go to war for one Roman citizen. However, if you were not a Roman citizen, you didn't have any rights. A horse had more rights than you. If you were a, a Roman lady and you decided to throw a party and entertain your guests by burning flesh, I can't imagine any Roman lady doing that, but they did. You couldn't burn a horse. You couldn't burn a dog. You couldn't burn a sheep. You couldn't burn a camel. But you could burn a slave. He had absolutely no rights. And as strange as it may seem, the animal was more carefully protected by the Romans than were the slaves. Now, Paul and his friends were treated as slaves who had no rights at all. In our country, you know, we'd rise up, or at least I, I hope we would anyway. I understand that there are all kinds of infractions of the law and mistreatments of U.S. citizens in our own legal system, but when we know openly that someone has been illegally mistreated, there is a, a natural re, re, repulsion against that, you know, uh, with a common citizen. These men were arrested without trial, without charge. They were beaten. I mean, that, basically, that's what Hitler and Eichmann did to the Jew. You know, with no trial, uh, no legal condemnation, they tried to annihilate them, and these men had no rights whatsoever. They were beaten with many stripes. In fact, the idiom would indicate that they had the, the maximum, uh, you know, allowed by law, you know, which would have been 39. And, you know, and we have Paul say in, in uh, 2 Corinthians, you know, I was beaten with stripes, 40 lashes minus one. That's 39 because the Romans had, had pretty much decided that 40 would kill you. So, you know, you couldn't give them 40. So they hit 39, and, and Paul had it happen three times. It seems to me uh, logical to assume that, that this is one of those times. It's amazing that they were in any condition at all to even speak in that Philippian jail, Must let, let alone just get up and walk out. But now Paul says... Uh, uh, Paul, Paul lays claim to Roman citizenship. He claims to be a Roman. We find that later, that later on in the book of Acts that they had a right uh, to that claim. Paul says, I was born a Roman. You couldn't have a higher claim. He was born a Roman. Well, he says, we're Roman citizens and without due process of law, you've beaten us and you've you know, tortured us basically. And now... You're going to just let us go? You know, Paul had every right to file claim in Roman court against those magistrates. And he could have caused them a lot of difficulty. He might have, might have even cost them their lives. But he's not doing that. He could have. They were desperately afraid. I think the lesson here is that there is nothing wrong at all for a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what you are, uh, messengers of the gospel, of reconciliation, in using the rights of the law. We should do that as long as the law allows it. You know, there's surely nothing wrong with using what the law allows. There was absolutely nothing wrong in what Paul said here. Uh, that... That was to the consternation of the magistrates. They entreated them, but they, uh, but they leave. They leave. They, uh, they, they came down uh, personally and apologized. And uh, rather than uh, carry, it in, carry it 
any further, we find that the grace of Christ and his ministers, they, they just departed. They didn't have to depart, but in verse 40, it says they did. Now in chapter 17, they come to Thessalonica. And here as Paul's uh, uh, manner was in verse 2, he went into the synagogue for three weeks, uh, three consecutive Sabbaths. So there he reasoned with those who were there, principally Jews, how that Christ had to suffer, die, and rise again. You'll remember uh, on the road to Emmaus, uh, uh, one of the disciples, uh, whoever it might have been, said uh, that we had hoped that it had been the, uh, that Christ, this is the one that would redeem Israel or would have redeemed Israel. And that's exactly what he was doing. But they were looking for redemption without a price for the forgiveness of sin uh, nonchalantly as though God could say, well, you know, just, you know, you know, because you're my child, I just won't hold sin against you. And that would violate the justice of God, dearly beloved. All right. And he couldn't do that. It was necessary that his servant, the branch, be the suffering Savior. And his countenance is so marred more than any man Nothing in him that we should desire. Him and Paul and you and I can argue from the Scriptures that, that Jesus Christ had to die, that, that Christ uh, must needs have suffered. In verse 3, uh, that's the must of necessity, not the must of obligation, but the must of necessity. He had to, he had to suffer and die, or there's no redemption for Israel. And then that he had to rise from the dead. And dearly beloved, listen to me. We need to consistently understand. We need to always understand that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the testimony of the completeness of his death. If what Christ accomplished on the cross is not sufficient, then he couldn't rise. The fact that he rose from the dead is the fact that God has been propitiated and that the death of Jesus Christ is sufficient, nothing to be added. So he not only had to die, he had to rise. And if he did not rise from the dead, then we have no confidence, we have no assurance whatsoever in our redemption. And... So he openly alleged this in the synagogue of the Jews, upsetting the world, religious system, as, as it was at that time, verse 6, saying, and this Jesus whom I preached to you is the promised Messiah. Some of them believed, and they went along with Paul and Silas, uh, joined them, and some of the devout Greeks did. A great multitude of them, in fact, did. And some of the, the, the chief women, not a few. Now, you'll note that in this, we've consistently looked so far in the book of, of Acts at the preaching of the Word, the preaching of Christ. Never once, never once have we seen an invitation just an open declaration of the word. And as I suggested earlier, an invitation as we know it today, which apparently in many lives is the mark of a spiritual church, never occurred in the world 200 years ago. I've talked about Charles Finney. It was an American invention because it plays on the emotion and it works. But we don't see that in any of these messages. What we see is a very simple presentation of the truth of the Word of God and how the Spirit works. It is the Spirit who brings the response, not the emotionalism of the hour. Okay? 
the Jews who believe not. Verse 5, they were greatly concerned about this. It was great envy because there were some of those who did agree and then joined with Paul and Silas. And so they caused problems. They particularly caused problems with Jason. And so Paul and his friends left. We might well have argued that they, they ought to stay. They ought to face the difficulty. The Lord Jesus Christ said, when you're persecuted in one city, you flee to another. And when you're persecuted in that city, you flee to the next. There are all kinds of uh, Christian uh, lawsuits today between uh, this group and that group on this basis and that basis. We even go so far as to have you know, one of our so-called Christian leaders suing someone for something, you know, we don't see any of that here. When they were persecuted, they didn't stay and fight. You know, if you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you're virtually reading Fox's Book of Suicides. And I say that with respect. The king says, I can't pray. You know, I'll run into the very presence of the king and I'll just fall down on my knees right in front of you and I'm, I'll pray to God and what, what happens? He gets his head cut off. I mean, what would you expect to happen? And I cannot find a verse, not a single one, of Scripture to support such an attitude. I mean, sure, you can turn to Daniel, I, I guess, and you can say, you know, uh, didn't he, didn't he pass a, a law? Wasn't there a law passed where Daniel, no one for that matter, was to really pray to, to any god, uh, but Daniel did. Did Daniel pray to another god? Yes, he did. But I don't think that Daniel rushed into the king's presence and said, you know, look here, king. And I mean, you know, you think you're so smart. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray to Jehovah. He didn't do that. He did exactly what he had always done. Now, I'm not suggesting to you in any way that, that if this country passes a law that you shouldn't pray in the privacy of your own bedroom or your own study or bathroom or wherever it is that you go, that you shouldn't. I think you should go ahead and practice what you've always done. But they left, and now they come to Berea. And there we find, of course, the fact that the uh, believers at Berea were more noble than the, those believers at Thessalonica and that they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether or not these things be so. The inference is clear that what was preached at Berea was the Scriptures, nothing else. What was presented was the Word of God, and that is why in this ministry, for example, we try to go verse by verse. We consider that of great value. Like in a survey like this, in Acts, you know, we try to go a little faster, you know, and it's a frustrating thing really for me to, to do that, but I try. It was the Scripture that was presented. It was the Scripture that was searched and the purpose of searching that Scripture was simply to find out whether this is so or not. Not to make a fool out of Paul, not to utterly destroy Silas, but to see whether or not these things are so. And that's what we do. We should search the Scriptures daily to see whether or not these things be so. And therefore, I conclude that this is the work of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. Many of them believed. Also, honorable women and men, both, who were Greeks, but when the Jews of Thessalonica knew this, boy, I mean, they're not going to let this happen. We can't let this happen in Berea. The Word of God was being preached there, so they stirred up the people again. And so the Berean uh, uh, 
sent, friends sent Paul away. Uh, verse 14, immediately they sent Paul away to go, as it were, to uh, the sea, but Silas and Timothy abode there, and Paul uh, brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment uh, under Silas and Timothy to come to him, with all speed they departed. So once again, they departed Berea in the presence of persecution, not that, not that they were going to stay and stubbornly resist. Obviously, the Spirit was driving them out. Uh, he now comes to Athens, and he's sitting there. He's waiting for Timothy and Silas uh, to come to him. You know, why, why he uh, sent word for them to come immediately, I don't know. But here he is at Athens. Uh, he finds that uh, it's a center of philosophy and of education and of learning. And he's, he's greatly concerned about the people in the city of Athens. Uh, they, have a, uh, they have a process there of, of, of speaking on anything that they wanted to speak on. And so Paul apparently was uh, led of the Spirit to preach the sermon that we all know as the sermon on, uh, Paul's sermon on Mars Hill, which begins at verse 22. And it ends at verse 30. It's very short. This is Paul's uh, sermon on, the Mount, on, on Mars Hill. Uh, there are two conclusions that you can reach about this sermon. The popular, uh, I guess, higher criticism conclusion is that, well, Paul tried for uh, once in his life and only wants to preach uh, philosophically. He tried to, to mimic or he tried to copy the philosophers of the, the Greeks who were the epitome of education and philosophy, uh, those separate from the Word of God. And Paul decided that in this case, you know, in his life to, to try to mimic them in their learning and uh, in their philosophy and it didn't work. So, you know, he never did that again. Uh, that's kind of the attitude or the approach taken by the, the, the higher so-called critics. I'm going to suggest to you a, a direct opposite, if that surprises you. Uh, I do not believe that that's the case. First of all, again, I assume, I don't, well, I don't assume, I, I work on the basis that the author is the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit uh, has something to say for you and for me, verse 22 through 31, that he is not simply recording a, a historical sermon by Paul uh, where he uh, tried to preach philosophy instead of the Word of God. Uh, for, because first of all, I think it's, uh, it's, well, just plain wrong to say that his message doesn't is not the Word of God. It's not the Word of God that he's preaching. Once again, like we uh, saw before, the sermon, uh, uh, well, here's a perfect illustration that a sermon ought to, ought to be only, uh, you know, nine verses, what, maybe ten verses long. On the other hand, we could uh, turn to another passage of Scripture where Paul preached all night and then some poor kid just couldn't uh, stay awake and he falls out the window and dies. Now, I don't think the length of a message is what's important. I do believe strongly, however, uh, that it ought to be centered in the Word of God. To me, it's, a, it's a, a brilliant leading of the Holy Spirit that He centers it right where that they were interested, these people were interested. Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill at the Areopagus there, and he said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things, I don't know what your Bible says, you know, superstitious, uh, that you're very religious. I see that in all things that you are much devoted to divinities. I even passed by, you know, through your, uh, your temples, I looked at your devotions and, and I found to my utter amazement an altar with the de uh, description to an unknown God. It isn't unknown gods. I recognize that in the Greek, you know, uh, 
the text is not articulated, but, but as a title it is, this was not many altars to many gods, but one altar to one unknown God, whom therefore you, you all ignorantly worship. He didn't spend a whole lot of time buttering him up. You know, within the first two sentences, he's already at the Word of God. You'll note that he did not offend. That is, he, he, was, he was not critical of what they were doing. You know, it's an easy thing, I think, for any one of us to, you know, to, to say, you know, well, you know, hey, you worship a snake, you know, a piece of stone, a cow. You know, bear in mind that outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no light. You know, you could have been just as critical of Peter, I, I suppose, before he was led by the Holy Spirit. He spoke a lot of nonsense over and over and over again. We got to understand that even those who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, who don't, who may not know it yet, are dwelling in darkness. And God has given us the rare privilege, the unbelievable opportunity to be a lamp bearer, not the light, but a bearer of the light, that we might at least have a small part in God bringing the knowledge of redemption to one of his own children. I am 100% persuaded that if you are unwilling to carry it, there will be another one who will. You know, kind of, kind of like Esther. You know, if you're not willing to do this, you know, Esther, Esther be advised that God will get it done, but you've missed the blessing. I do not believe that God is dependent upon your voice or my voice, you know, your legs or my arms or my feet or your, uh, you know, your intelligence or your money. Or I, I do not believe that it makes one whit of difference in the eternal redemption of any single child of God, whether you are faithful or unfaithful, but I believe it makes a tremendous difference in your communion, in your fellowship, and even, yes, even in your reward. But God is not dependent upon you. I mean, what an atrocious thing to even think. I mean, you know, you know, for modern evangelists, you know, the best of them, you know, infer in many a message that if you're not faithful, then somebody might die and go to hell who otherwise would have gone to heaven Folks, I believe that is as close to blasphemy as any child of God could get. Listen to me. Nobody, nobody's eternal destiny hangs in your balance. All right? It's in God's hands, not yours. Now, Paul goes on to say, I declare him unto you. But he's not critical of their ignorance. He's not critical of their idolatry. He's not critical of their foolishness because they dwell in darkness. And the religious system which controls them can't meet their needs. The religious system of super fundamentals cannot meet the needs of God's people. The religious system of liberalism cannot meet the needs of God's people. The Holy Spirit meets their needs through the Word of God. And so he doesn't need to run down their other deities. Now he introduces this unknown God. You don't know who this God is, but I do. This is the sovereign God, the monarch of all the ages. This is the sovereign God of all eternity. Folks, I've suggested to you, in fact, I've, I've suggested to you when this survey began a few weeks ago or whenever it was, that surely the dominant theme of the Word of God is the sovereignty of God. We may believe that the dominant theme of, of the Bible is redemption. I believe without any question that the dominant theme of the Bible is God. I am a jealous God. There is no God like me. No, there is no God like my rock. There is no rock like our rock. 
I'm the Lord God I'm Almighty. I kill, I make alive. I make the blind to see. I make the deaf to hear. It is I that, that doeth these things, saith the Lord. And I think that you'd, be, you'd have to be blind not to realize that God demands glory. That's where Paul started. God who made the world, He made all things, and He made the world and all the things in it. Now you're a little bit familiar at least with Greek mythology. You know how that they decided that the world was made. You know, their gods were like genies in little bottles and, you know, and if you treated them just right, you know, you had good crops and you had good lots of rain and, you know, uh, and you, you also had a god of war and, you know, and another god of fertility, you know, and if, and if the gods were angry, then in one way or another you had to appease them you know, the gods were your little, your, your, your tool that you could manipulate. That's not this unknown God. He made the world. He made everything in it. He's the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth. And He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Neither is He worshipped with man's hands. We worship God in spirit and in truth, folks. Worship of God is not by men's hands, and many a Christian is just as guilty of that today. All that service may be, you know, things may come, but, you know, out of a willing heart, I understand that. But the worship of God is a spiritual exercise, and it must be done in the Holy Spirit and through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is not worshiped with men's hands by you bringing sacrifice, by you appeasing Him in some way. That is not the God of this book. That's not the way this God is worshipped. You know, as though He needed anything. To me, that's a, that's a wake-up call for all of us today. You know, for many a time, we, we've inadvertently, you know, well, we present our God as though, you know, He needs something, you know. God was there in heaven all alone and, and he needed fellowship. He was lonely and he needed communion. So he created a man to fill this void in his life and in his experience. And what have you got? Well, you've got a God who's not really God or less than God. Seeing it's, the, it's he who gives to all life and breath and everything else. We're not giving him anything. He's giving it all. That is the striking difference between paganism and Christianity. And I define paganism as anything other than Christianity. Paganism is a religion. And a religion is that which man comes up with in his ways to appease an angry God. You know, to somehow satisfy God and to serve God. Christianity is directly the opposite. Christianity is the revelation of who God is and what God has done for you and me. And that's what Paul is doing here by the leading of the Holy Spirit. God gives it all. We don't give Him anything. He gives it all to us. Now, verse 36 Verse 36, I think, is, uh, is often misunderstood without a doubt. The major uh, commentaries have used this verse in such a way that many a Christian has uh, come to see the, uh, it's They've used it for sex and racial discrimination. Uh, the white supremacists love to use this verse. That's, that's where we're going to pick up next week, Lord willing. I love you all. I truly do. Wherever you're at, stay warm. Uh, it's going to be a skate rink, an ice skating rink here in Oklahoma the next couple of days. Pray for me in the direction of this ministry as we always are constantly praying for you. Lord bless you. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks, Thanks for watching.